Hello, my name is Adele Tomlin, and for the third interview of Dakini Conversations, I speak with British journalist and author Mick Brown. As I mentioned recently, it was reading Mick Brown's book, Dance of 17 Lives, the true life story of the 17th Kamapa on a plane to India for the first time in 2005 that led me to meet the Tibetan Buddhist master and lineage head, 17th Kamapa Ogin Trinle Dorje, for the first time. This meeting led to me completely changing my life as a qualified lawyer and strategist in the City of London to take up practice and studies of Tibetan language and Buddhist philosophy. Brown's book tells the story of the 17th Kamapa, the spiritual head of a 900-year-old main lineage of Tibetan Buddhism, Kama Kagyu. Mick Brown was born in 1950 in London and is a British journalist and author who has written for several British newspapers, including The Guardian and The Sunday Times, and currently works for the newspaper The Daily Telegraph. He is also a broadcaster and the author of several books about travel, music and spirituality. For example, his second book, American Heartbeat, Travels from Woodstock to San Jose by song title, was shortlisted for the Thomas Cook Prize for Best Travel Book in 1994. Also, his book, The Spiritual Tourist, catalogued contemporary spiritual quests around the globe, particularly in India. Brown also compiled a companion album to the book, Music for the Spiritual Tourist. As a journalist, Brown has interviewed well-known figures such as Salvador Dali, The Rolling Stones, James Brown, Ravi Shankar, Diana Ross, Richard Branson, and more. So Mick Brown, thank you very much for agreeing to be interviewed on uh, Dakini Conversations. Uh, it's very nice to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you. Well, first of all, um, please could we start with some uh, a little bit more about your 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 biographical background, uh, about mm -hmm. where you came from, a little bit about your your education, and uh, how you became uh, a journalist and a writer. Okay. Uh, well, I was born in London. Uh, grew up in London. Um, I've always lived in London. Uh, I had always wanted to be a journalist from the age of about 11, uh, and it took me a little while to sort of find my, my way into it. Um, but I suppose from the age of, uh, I don't know, 18, 19, uh, I've been writing for sort of publications, uh, written for most of the, uh, no, 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 let me rephrase that, uh, writing for various publications, uh, spent a little bit of time in America, where I was writing for Rolling Stone, the Los Angeles Free Press. Uh, then coming back to England, uh, reviewed music for The Guardian, wrote music features for The Guardian, worked for the Sunday Times, for the Sunday Correspondent. Uh, and for the last 30 plus years, uh, I've written pri primarily for The Daily Telegraph and The Telegraph magazine, and I'm a staff writer on The Daily Telegraph. And uh, so what was it that led you into becoming a journalist then? I mean, sort of, as you grew up in England, from London what what was it that made you decide to go into that well I think I always had a, a curiosity about things around me and an appetite to know more about things around me uh and also is that sense of discovery I think that if you if you if you come across something that's interesting something that's fascinating to you something that's revelatory to, to you for me, the first impulse was always to turn to somebody and say wow isn't isn't this interesting isn't this incredible uh, and I, I guess that's what was a prime thing in leading me into journalism was to be able to say to a larger number of people, wow, isn't this interesting? Isn't this wonderful? Uh, and initially when I started writing, uh, uh, I was writing a lot about music. So it's a natural impulse to, um, if you're writing about Bobby Womack or James Brown or Aretha Franklin to yeah. say, wow, this is incredible. Uh, but then that extent ended outwards and outwards and I, I write far less far far less about music hardly at all about music now and haven't done for for, for for a number of years so I write across a wide spectrum of things uh for the telegraph I do um uh, a, a big interviews uh, investigations uh feature writing about all sorts of different things I, I think I have the best job in the world actually because yeah. you know that affords me the opportunity opportunity to meet uh, a huge variety of uh, very interesting people and to go to very interesting places and writing the books was was a natural development of that to to to, to, to be able to do that at, at a at a much greater length and, and to explore things in a much greater depth 
So is that where you started then with the music journalism? Because actually I'm a huge fan of music and I use music a lot in, in my own work. Um, so what was the sort of first big musical journalism piece that you did? Ah, uh, well, it, it, I mean, it wouldn't be big in anybody else's eyes, but for me it was big. <laughs> yeah. uh, when I was about 15, uh, I, 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 I ran a, a soul music fanzine, I guess you'd call them. Uh, and I was very fortunate to have a, a, an elder cousin who'd introduced me to American R&B. And so I'd ride off to American record companies like Duke, uh, Atlantic, Wonderful, uh, Fame, these, these terribly evocative to me names. And every now and again, I get this sort of care package from America of um, R&B 45s. Uh, and so I'd write about them and I'd write reviews and so forth. And I worked in a, in a, in a record shop in, uh, in, in West Croydon. Uh, so I'd sell the magazine in there and buy postal order. Um, so that was, you know, that was the first introduce, introduction to writing about music. But since then, uh, you know, I've interviewed, I've been very fortunate to interview a lot of my heroes, uh, particularly in soul music, mm. um, Mark Gay, Diana mm. Ross, uh, Barry Gordy, who, who founded Motown, James Brown, I interviewed a couple of times. Uh, I've interviewed the Rolling Stones, uh, George Harrison, um, you know, some, some of the major, major figures, certainly my my, my generation of music. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I couldn't pretend to, 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 to know about contemporary music really in any, in any great way. Uh, I, I realised that the time to stop writing about music, I, I was doing reviews for The Guardian, uh, and I was sitting in a concert uh, by The Cure, writing a review, trying to think, how am I going to describe for the umpteenth time waves of sound crashing over the audience and i also had this realization that i was probably the only person uh, sitting there uh with a wife three children and a dog to walk when i got home and i realized at that point that it was time to stop <laughs> trying to be au courant with the, with the whatever the contemporary <laughs> scene was uh and stop reviewing um but you know i've i've uh Tom Waits. I'm just thinking of people I have I have interviewed. Yeah. I tell you, actually, what's interesting to me is that um, I've already gone about this, but one of the most charismatic, probably the single most charismatic mm. person uh, I've interviewed was Diana Ross, actually. Mm. And I vividly remember this was in New York, uh, in those very neutral surroundings of a, of a sort of hotel lounge. Um, and she walked in, and it was as if she'd sucked every atom of light to shine <laughs> on her. Uh, it was quite extraordinary, and I've always been interested in in charisma. You know, what constitutes charisma? Mm. Does, does it emanate from a person, or is it you projecting something onto a person? Right. Yeah. Well, uh, we'll uh, get onto this when we talk about obviously the seventeenth. Very Marcus, much so. Very much who, so. Yeah. Um, yeah. As as you know, as you've met him yourself, uh, many people think has enormous charisma and emanates huge amounts of kind of light, if you like. But but um, you know, obviously connected to meditative practice, right? So that's mm. a whole other kind of uh, topic. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure Diana Ross was into meditative practice. <laughs> well, I, I don't know. I mean, you know, they say that uh, practitioners are everywhere, but yes, I I don't know yeah. about that either. But um, so you moved away from music journalism then, and uh, if we we'll, well, we'll start looking at how you got connected into Buddhism or Tibetan Buddhism, because are you a Buddhist hmm. yourself? Are you, do you follow that or follow a Lama? Uh, no, I'm not. Uh, and and we'll, we'll come to this a bit later on when, yeah. you, when we come talking about the response to the book. Yes. Uh, exactly. No, I'm not, a, I'm not, I'm not a Buddhist, but, but I, I think I describe myself as a sort of Buddhist sympathizer. Yes. Uh, and I became very interested in, 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 in Buddhism. Uh, I, I don't quite know why. I guess it starts with sort of again some of my generation, uh, you know, reading Jack Kerouac, uh, being mm. very enamoured of sort of the narrative story of the Beats, Gary Snyder, Allen Ginsberg. Uh, growing up in that period when, uh, for me, I uh, when I was young, I always looked to America because of the music, uh, but a lot of my generation would look in East, uh, and and so that sort of search for enlightenment to put a cliche on it uh, uh i think was very sort of much a part of my uh my growing understanding of the world and my growing interest i remember a very good friend of mine went off to india probably in 1970 uh and became a follower of sai baba 
Um, and that was kind of interesting to me. And I subsequently wrote about Sai Baba in, in, in the spiritual tourism. So I always had that growing interest in in, in sort of Eastern Eastern philosophy. Mm. Um, and, well, and uh, if we could just um, mention, obviously, your 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 trips to India or, and your book, The Spiritual Tourist. So could you tell us just a little bit about that? Because, um, you know, that's obviously very much connected into India as well, right? Sure. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I've been writing uh, a number of magazine pieces uh, to do with that. Uh, and I just wanted to explore the, the whole subject of sort of the West relationship to Indian spirituality, really. And uh, I, I've got a new book which is coming up, which explores that in more sort of historical detail. Um, and so what I did with the with the spiritual tourists was it, it's very much a sort of rather eccentric and rather sort of um uh I don't want to say chaotic, <laughs> rather uh, uh, journey through these different different um mm. different uh, systems, I suppose you might say. Uh at that time I'd also interviewed a very or, or met a very interesting uh, guy, uh but with Van Morrison, in fact, and it was Van Morrison who first um, took me along to see uh, to see this rather wonderful gentleman called Benjamin Cream, who had been a theosophist uh, and was now sort of proclaiming, as it were, the the the, the coming of Maitreya. Uh, so I, I I got to know Ben a bit and and, and had written about that. Uh, I'd also written about um, Mother Mira uh, in in Germany. And so those were really the starting points for, and I was getting interested in Buddhism. So the, all these things became sort of touchstones for this journey, I guess you could call it, that I took in, in the spiritual tourist. And it, it took me, part of that journey took me to a Sarah monastery in the south of India uh, and a young Spanish boy who'd been recognized as a, as a Tibetan reincarnate. Mm. So I included that in the book. And so that was another point of, of drawing me closer towards Buddhism and, and particularly an interest in uh, the whole politics of reincarnation. I mean, the philosophical right. uh, underpinning of reincarnation, but also the, the politics of reincarnation. Yeah. And so, when, when the Karmapa uh, came out of uh, came out of Tibet in uh, in, in two thousand, um, you know, that was something that, that fascinated me really, and I wanted to explore that. And I originally went to went to India to try and write a magazine story about that. Uh, but wasn't able to meet the Karmapa at that point. He wasn't given yeah. any interview. Journalists were pretty much sort of banned. Um, but nonetheless, I, I, I thought I wanted to write a book about this and to sort of discuss this with my publisher. And once that was all set up, you know, so I was off, so to speak. Great. Well, um, before we get into the obviously the real meat and content of the book, which, you know, as I say, mm -hmm. is a, for me was uh, extremely life changing. But I think. The book itself well, I'm, is I'm actually... I'm very honoured to hear you say that. I, I mean, it's extraordinary if that was the case. I feel very flattered that you say that. Well, definitely, because I didn't know anything about uh, the Tibetan reincarnation, the system. I wasn't a Tibetan Buddhist when I went there. So in a way, your book was actually a very uh, helpful introduction to that as well, because as you say, you do go into the sort of political background and all the sort of other sorts of, you know, historical issues connected with reincarnation and with um, political control in Tibet. So it was absolutely fascinating, but it also did lead me to meet the 17th Karmapa, which we're going hmm. to talk about. So, um, but in in the in the book, uh, you do mention that, um, you know, you had met some Tibetan Buddhist lamas previously, uh, particularly also in New York, right, at the, the 16th Karmapa yeah, that there. Yeah, that KTD in Woodstock, that, that was very interesting. I, I was I, I was doing a series of uh, articles for the Telegraph magazine uh, across America by song title, uh, visiting different places that you know were associated with with particular songs, uh, St. Louis, San Jose, uh, Milwaukee, uh, and so I went to Woodstock and um, and I noticed a, a, a notice on a, on, a, on a board there uh, about. Uh, uh, a Tibetan Lama was going to be speaking at a, a, a Tibetan monastery there. So I went up just to have a look at that. Uh, and it was Ponlop Rinpoche. And uh, very, I, I was I was rather taken by him. He's very, uh, very engaging, very hip young guy, uh, talking about Tibetan Buddhist practice in a way that um, uh, made it very uh, understandable to all the people gathered around. 
and 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 he talked about the uh, the, the coming of the uh, reincarnation of the the seventeenth kamapa. We talked about the death, I should say, of the sixteenth kamapa, and the expectation of the reincarnation of the seventeenth kamapa. And when I, some years later, uh, I, I should say that then became part of a book, uh, American Heartbeat. Um, and then some years later, when I decided to write the book about, um, or, or decided to, to to explore the story of Karmapa, uh, I went out to India and went to Gyoto Monastery, and uh, I'd arranged to um, that somebody was going to come and, and talk to me. I was actually sitting outside the monastery. I couldn't at that point go into the monastery, but I was sitting in, inside the uh, in in the grounds. Uh, uh, and this figure came walking down the steps and uh, came up to me, and I recognised him as the as the young Rinpoche who I'd seen in KTD in Woodstock, you know, many years before. Yeah. Uh, and and I told him this. So this was a sort of a rather wonderful kind of, I mean, he didn't re remember me from Woodstock, obviously, uh, but he thought this was very auspicious that I should have, um, that I should have seen him there. And so that was a very important building block actually in, in terms of my being able to establish uh, some sort of connection, you know, with the people around around Kama. Right, exactly. Well, and also you mentioned about the this um, music musical journey across America, but also with the spiritual tourists, you also produce an album for that. Is that right as well with the music? Yeah, well, I, I, I actually produced. I mean, I I I, I compiled myself, it. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I compiled it uh, myself and 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 a guy uh, with the American uh, American. Uh, record company or co company that we're going to put this put this out uh so that was fun yeah putting together a number of a number of different pieces of music um not not all uh indian uh, uh, none of them i don't think particularly related to to buddhism but people like i you know we, we wanted to get Nitin sauna for some reason Nitin sauna uh declined to allow one of his records to be used um I remember a wonderful kind of gospel song, Sheep, Sheep, which I thought was kind of interesting to include. Mm -hmm. uh, some new agey kind of stuff. Um, oh, there's some great stuff on there. Yeah, right. oh, definitely. Uh, I mean, definitely. Yeah, yeah uh, I mean, as yeah. I say, I'm a huge fan of music and I would certainly also recommend the book Spiritual Tories, which I've also read. Um, it's a very oh, entertaining you. book indeed. Now, let's go into then the Tulku system and we'll go into sort of the actual kind of chapters of your book. Um, so in the second chapter of your book, you do start, talk about the kind of background to the Tulku system. Now, for those who are not familiar with what a Tulku is, you know, it's a reincarnated, recognized, reincarnate Lama, right? So you mentioned mm. how the Kamapas in particular, you know, had a very unique and some would say were the first Tulkus actually really in an official sort of way had a, a unique way of leaving a prediction letter um, before they passed away, saying where they would be reborn and to whom. So you, you talk about that. And mm. you even mentioned the 16th Kamapa's prediction about Ponlop Rinpoche, the Lama that you met at KTD, right? Um, mm. do, do, you, uh, do you remember that, that he predicted the, the birth? I do. And I mean, this, this obviously is one of the things that once you start exploring this, you know, it's like a sort of, you're down the rabbit hole then you know mm. you can't get out you just want to go deeper and deeper and deeper and try and understand this this extraordinary sort of process of yeah uh, of, of 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 recognition which i see in my mind as a sort of it's a it's a, a, a combination of magic and real politic you know or maybe it's better to say the supernatural and real politic because the two things are, are inextricably linked and this it's it's unique. It's unique in the world. There is nowhere else other than Tibet where this is this has occurred. Uh, and somebody's used this rather rather wonderful phrase of Tibet as, as a factory for state, a factory for saints, <laughs> and that really derives from the uh, from this uh, this process of of, of uh, identifiable reincarnation. And as you say, the 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 Kamapas uh, are unique in having left a predictive letter. Yeah. Uh, for when the next when the next incarnation would be found. But but um, and this, yeah. Sorry, go on. No, because I was just saying because um there was that prediction that I read in the book you mentioned where the like, sixteen Kamapa had mentioned that to um Ponlat Rinpoche's mother that you know she was going to give birth to a Tulku and she didn't even know she was pregnant, right? There's that right. and that kind of thing is quite sort of strange, isn't it? Don't you think? 
yeah, it's very strange, but it's not it's not uncommon. I mean, you know, yeah. if you want signs of wonders, uh, Tibetan yeah. Buddhism is the place to go. Uh, and uh, you know, somebody should actually compile a sort of compendium of every sign and wonder that that, yeah. <laughs> that occurs in the in the histories and hagiographies of of of, of, of great uh, uh, Tibetan Buddhist saints. So uh, so that's one. Um, Again, there are so many other things to do with with the Kamapa. I mean, the sixteenth Kamapa mm. was particularly said to to have these. And I don't want to use the word magical, but to have these sort of supernatural powers, where he would um, he was a great lover of a uh, great lover of birds. And uh, in, in, in his monastery in Serpu, he had uh, uh, sorry in Rumtek, he had um, a, a large number of aviaries, and uh, he would talk to the birds. Uh, and it was said that uh, some of the birds, when they died, would just remain mm. upright on their perches in, in a state of sort of meditative, I forget the exact term. But tuk dam, of, yeah, in the tuk dam. Very yeah. much. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and he was also able, it was said, to sort of to change the weather. Uh, yes. In terms of the knower of the three times, I mean, this is the, the phrase that was used at the come up as, uh, so knowers of the past, uh, knowers of the present, and knowers of the future. So there's a lot of prophecy, but also uh, going beyond that, uh, and this was also said, I'll come to this a bit later on, about the 17th Kamapa, mm. uh, but the 16th Kamapa, uh, stories about him leaving footsteps on, mm. on, on, on an icy river and the footsteps still being there when the ice had melted. Uh, I was up at Same Ling, which was the, the, the Kagyu monastery in, uh, in Scotland, uh, and there's a very large stone there where the 16th Kamapa visited and left a footprint in the stone. And yes. Sounds incredible, but you look at it and it's quite clear. I mean, it's a piece of hard Scottish granite stone. and there is a footprint. Yes. There. Well, I actually uh, found a picture of that, which I will um, sort of publish along with this interview. Oh, you must. Um, yeah, because when I was reading your book again. Um, but you do go, you do mention quite a bit about these miraculous abilities of the Sixteen Kamapa in your book, and also how his reincarnation was, uh, as prophesied by the previous 15th Kamapa, did happen exactly yeah. as it had been prophesied in that letter. Um, yes. But at that time, um, you know, the Dalai Lama and the Giluk uh, were, were in power after the Mongolians sort of helped them take over Tibet. And so they had to actually, what was interesting in that chapter was you're talking about how they had to bestow huge gifts and offerings, uh, even having to get the help of the King of Bhutan to get the 13th Dalai Lama to recognize their toku. Now, this is something obviously, which is more in the political sphere, but um it's interesting that even then, you know, the you know, what comes out in the book, obviously, about the 17th Kamapa is one of the things Shamar Rinpoche was saying was that the Dalai Lamas have no role to play in these recognitions. And yet, even for the 16th Kamapa, they were they were very much a part of that, right? Yeah, I think they, they I, I, I mean, he's right to say they have no role in the identification of. Yeah. Uh, but certainly the Dalai Lama as the sort of Dalai Lama, as I should say, as the sort of the ultimate, you might say, spiritual authority within Tibetan Buddhism. At uh, that time, yeah. At that time. Had a, had, <laughs> yeah, I just qualify that. <laughs> uh, had, a, had, had a role in actually affirming the recognition. Uh, and right. you might say this would be a question of protocol or a question of power or a question of politics. But nonetheless, that was the case. I mean, the, the whole imbroglio uh, uh, between the Gelug and the Kagyu, the red hats and the yellow hats, you know, this goes back to what, the 14th century, 14th century, yeah. 13, 15th century, I think. I it's mean, a big, 15th. yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a very big topic. And also the thing is, you know, to this day, as you mentioned also in your book, you know, the Mongolians with the uh, Gilug and Dalai Lama, you know, they did seize and take over a lot of uh, Kagyu monasteries, destroyed quite a lot of them yeah. as well. And interestingly, the 17th Kamap has recently been teaching on this. In fact, uh, a couple of weeks ago, he gave a very, um, quite an extensive teaching on the Kagyu monasteries, the 8th Kamap has set up and how one of them in particular had been appropriated and taken over by the Gilug and was now the Ganden Monastery, which is a very big, important Gilug Monastery. But anyway, that's another topic. 
But going back into your book, um, because in the chapter three, you, you sort of also then go into this whole thing of the Chinese takeover of Tibet, which obviously is very important. And that's when mm. the Dalai Lama met Chairman Mao, the 16th Kalmapa met Chairman Mao, and they signed the 17-point um, agreement um, exactly. when the Dalai Lama was 15 years old. So then uh, they escaped uh, mm -hmm. into Tibet, in, into India, sorry, and the 16th Kamapa went into Sikkim and he was given land to establish mm -hmm. Ramtek. So this is also in your book. Now, again, we could go into the politics of what was happening between Gilug at that time and the Kagyu, but again, I would recommend people read the book on that um, to find out more. It's very complicated. It's very complicated. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, you know, the 13th Settlement Organization. That was fascinating because I hadn't heard of that before until I read your book, but that yeah. was headed up by someone called Gong Tang Sultrim, who I later read had actually been assassinated uh, by shotgun. And, and there were allegations that this was um, had been arranged by the Tibetan government in exile at that time. Let me let me let me backtrack a little bit. One of the things that uh, that was very interesting to me uh, in, in, in writing this book uh, was that I think like many Westerners, when I first uh, encountered, I suppose is the word, when I first encountered uh, Tibetan Buddhism, uh, I was very, uh, very enamored and very, um, you might almost say starry eyed. And what we've just been talking about, about the, the the miracles uh, and, and the sublime, uh, the sublime teachings. I mean, uh, and that obviously is what is the, the core of this. It's not about miracles. It's about the teachings, mm. uh, and the sub sublimity of these uh, teachings. Um, I remember very vividly having a conversation with the Dalai Lama's um, younger brother when I was in Dharamsala, uh, one of the many times I went there in the course of writing this book. Uh, and we were talking about this, and, and he kind of gave me a rather indulgent smile and said, oh, yes, 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 Shangri-La syndrome. And I think that is real, and I think that actually underpins many, many, many of the problems and difficulties and misunderstandings that, are, that have arisen over the years, particularly coming from the West about Tibetan Buddhism. And one thing I can say categorically is that the more I got into this book, the more I got into writing this book, the politics, the intrigues, mm. the gossip make the Borgias look like the teddy bear's pig. Yeah, I think that's the thing. And when you when we get into also obviously this um, dispute yeah. that happened between the 17 come up, yeah. that really comes out very clearly in your book, quite shockingly so, actually. So let us just well, like, go... That's me. No, I mean, but uh, when I say shockingly, I mean, you know, when you're talking about alleged assassinations, you know, planned accidents yeah. or, you know, calling people liars and saying that they forged letters, which we're going to get onto, obviously, because obviously um, that is also something that a lot of people may not really know about. And that's one of the things about your book is it does go into a lot of detail while, and you're interviewing all the main people. Excuse me. Excuse um, me for my bottom. Yeah. So, um so chapter three and four, you talk about the escape from Tibet and you mention also the 16 come up, you know, talk about how he came to Rumtek and what he did there. And also then his travels into the West um, and how, you know, he accumulated a lot of Western followers and students and the, the Freda Bedi connection, mm -hmm. Chogyam Trumpa and Akron oh, Rinpoche in England. And then obviously in the USA, where he was performing the Black Vajra crown ceremony with a fascinating anecdote about Mary Finnegan and her vision of the Kamapra's Chen Rezik. Um, and then of, of then the 16 Kamapa passing away uh, due to um, cancer and the miraculous mm. kind of conduct he showed uh, during his time at hospital. Yeah, that, that particularly I found very, very, very moving. Uh, and I spoke to the to the physician who who looked after the looked after the Kamapa in his last, last days there in, 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 the, in the hospital in America uh, and how everybody around him, uh, it wasn't as if uh, the Kamapa had come in to be looked after, it was as if the Kamapa had come in to be to look after them uh, and they felt sort of uh, illuminated by his, by his presence uh, and everybody obviously just fell in love with him uh, and also the nature of his the nature of his death uh, 
you know, the fact that that, that his his heart remained warm for three days after his death, and that his 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 fingers, body remained pliant. Um, you know, science science can't explain mm. these kinds of things. Really. Yes, it's a very moving chapter in the book when you talk about how he he coped with the sickness, how he was around other people, but also how he passed away, and you know how he seemed to be monitoring, controlling his body reactions to quite a large degree as well, which sort of flummoxed right. the, the the staff there. Right. They couldn't quite understand it. Um, and it would be great to talk about that more as well. But obviously, because of time limits, we, we'll get into the sort of the the, the whole recognition of the 17th Karl Marx oh. after the 16th Karl Marx passed away. Now, um, the Kagyu Heart Sons uh, you mentioned in the book are Tai Sita Rinpoche, the Shamapa Rinpoche, Gyalsa Rinpoche, and Jamgun Kontra Rinpoche. And they are considered the four main Heart Sons. And you talk, you mentioned that. Um, and you, in chapter five, you talk about this golden rosary of Kagyu and you meet Tai Sita at Sherub Ling, um, hmm. who actually speaks very highly of the Shamapa, right? And, um, and he talks about his close relationship with him. But... Um, you mentioned about the banning of the tenth Shamapa. So maybe you could say a little bit about that before we get on to the actual what happened with the the fourteenth Shamapa. So why was the tenth Shamapa banned by the sort of Giluk government? Oh God, here we are back in politics. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this is in the is it the sixteenth seventeenth century? Yeah. Uh, and it's 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 too complicated to go into great detail, but it, yeah. but it involves. It involves the Panchen Lama. Uh, it involves a question of recognition. Uh, it also it, the, the upshot of this is that the Shama Rinpoche uh, leaves Tibet. The Shama Rinpoche of that time leaves uh, Tibet and goes to Nepal uh, and is accused of inciting the Nepalese to uh, invade Tibet, which they do. Um, and as a consequence of that, the 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 the, the Gelug, who were the ruling most powerful uh, school, and um, the Dalai Lama at that time, the the, the Shama uh, reincarnations are, 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 are banned. Isn't quite the right word, but mm. let's use the word banned. Uh, and the Shama seat is 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 is, is, is sort of taken to um, uh, taken to Lhasa and and is destroyed, vaporized. You know, as a sort of symbol of of the of the ending of the of the, of the of the Shamar line, um, the counter argument is that the uh, the, the Shamars continued to be supposedly continued to be reborn, reincarnated, and continued to be recognised uh, internally as the Shamar, but without being formally recognised yes. as the Shamar. So these people were being reincarnated, but there was a uh, a sort of missing what whereas there should have been a 12 13 14 15 etc. yes in those lines they weren't recognized and it's not until um fairly recently in this story that then the uh 10th shamar uh is is formally recognized and uh that recognition is ratified by the dalai lama and so the the, the, the 10th shamar uh, the, fo the, the 14th the, the do you mean the 14th shamapa the 14th, yes. Sorry, yes. The 14th. Okay, so we're going on now into chapter six of your book, which is very provocatively titled Honey on the Razor Blade. And uh, this is a chapter which is talking about what happened after the 16th come up passed away. And he set up a revolving regency, um, which was starting with the, the 14th Shamapa. So you mentioned in that book that um, Topka Yulgel became the general secretary of uh, Rumtek, and this is when the trouble literally started. That's what it says in the book. So I wonder if you could just give uh, us a little bit of a brief overview about who he is or, and, and was, and also you mentioned he was smuggling gold and money and that no charges <laughs> were ever brought. And he was very um, intimately connected with the Bhutanese royal family, right? He married uh, one he of married the, royal the royal family. Yeah, he, he, I mean, he, he became the... the uh, there was a there was a a, a general secretary of of Rumtek, uh, uh, Rumtek being the being the uh, the, the Kamapas monastery, of course. Uh, and then part of the fallout was that that general secretary 
uh, then died under somewhat mysterious uh, circumstances, uh, the allegation being that he'd been poisoned. Uh, and Topka uh, then assumed the, uh, the, the, the position as uh, uh, General Secretary of, of Room uh, and And he was described to me by somebody as honey, honey on the razor blade, which, as you say, is a, is a pretty sort of chilling sort of um, a very smooth guy. Uh, he had been a monk uh, and then had, had given up his robes in order to marry uh, a Bhutanese princess. Uh, very smooth, adopted sort of very slick Western suits, uh, had a very smooth, persuasive manner about him. Uh, and yeah, he was embroiled in a couple of um, yeah. allegations of, of smuggling where he was uh, arrested at um, uh, arrested at an Indian airport bringing gold in and, and watches uh, from Hong Kong. Uh, that was all dropped at the request of the Bhutanese government. Um, but he was very much uh, Shamar Rinpoche's man, and uh, he was very keen to assert the fact that Shamar Rinpoche, this all goes to, 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 to the question of who was the most important of the heart sons and who had historically been the most important of the heart sons. And so Shamar was pressing his case that it was he, the Shamar, who had been the next in, in, in seniority, as it were, after the 16th Kamar for himself, although this could be disputed because... Over the years, and particularly since the since since the previous Shamar, the earlier Shamar had been had been banned, so to speak. Uh, the Shamars, of course, had played absolutely no part in recognizing Karmapas. And yes. so what happened after the after the 16th died, uh, what then had to happen was that the recognition letter, the, the, the pre-written recognition letter had to be found. Right. And and this is where the arguments then started yes. breaking out. Okay, they, well, let, yeah, we'll just wait a little bit before we get onto this, the letter and the discovery of it. It's an uh, important yeah. part. But, you know, you mentioned that uh, the previous General Secretary from Te had there was an allegation of poisoning in, in the book. And in fact, um, it suggested that it was actually even possibly Top Guy himself, because here the... The general secretary died an hour after meeting him of a heart attack, and uh, they said there was uh, signs of suspected poisoning. But again, no post mortem was done on the body. So again, no, that's, that's right. some yeah. Um, and the regency of Rumtek was dissolved when he took over, right? So he basically effectively. So the sixteen Kamapa had said that it would be a revolving regency. First the Shamapa, then you know Taisi to Gyas Rimshay and Jamun Kontra Rimshay, right? The four heart sons. So that was dissolved, right? And that was on the yeah. that was due to Topgar who dissolved it for the Shamapa. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah, no, that's right. That's right. Yeah, and, and so the, so the Shamar then uh, was trying to assert his sort of uh, assert his position at, at at the top of this pyramid, so to speak. Uh, that's yeah. correct. I, and so as a consequence of that. Uh, <laughs> And again, it's it's so mired in in, in ambiguity and and confusion. Uh, but the the preeminent thing is, who is going to find the letter? Right. Who is going to be the person that brings forth the reincarnation of the Karmapa? And so, yeah. for a long, long time, the letter couldn't be found. And there were these various meetings that were held between the four heart sons, uh, and extraordinarily, because in the absence of a letter. Uh, they decided, well, we, we can't show that we haven't found the letter. Uh, and so they concocted this sort of scheme, uh, which is rather absurd in retrospect. They concocted this scheme uh, to, 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 to place in a gal box, in, mm -hmm. in, 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 a, in a, a, a sacred box, uh, a verse which one of the heart sons, Gyaltseb, had remembered the 16th Kamapa reciting to him. Uh, and so they did this in order to stall yeah. the decision and in order to try and reassure uh, the people who were waiting for the recognition of the... It, right, the exactly. Well, uh, during uh, when when the letter was eventually discovered, so like you say, there'd been this kind of thing, the other thing put in the girl box to kind of stall people. Um, and at that time in Tibet, you mentioned there was a relaxing of pol uh, the policy there, right? So the lamas were more lamas, like the Karma Kagyu lamas in particular, were going into Tibet. They were doing projects there. Right. And uh, in fact, um, you know, 
so that there was that sort of a kind of a bit more relaxation. So by 1989, um, it was considered they still hadn't found the letter, and Taisi Tu went into a series of retreats. Um, and that's when he remembered that when he was in Bodh Gaya in 1980, um, laying a foundation stone for a monastery, um, he had been asked to share a room with the 16 Karmapa. And at that time, the Karmapa gave him a talisman, which was sewn with brocade, right? In fact, I'm just going to... I, I think, I think they, were in, they were in uh, Calcutta. Right. Um, I've just got these pictures here because this is the talisman here. You can see that's the one that Taisi is showing in a film that was made about this. And this was the, the letter with the seal that he found within it. Um, so he he remembered that the Karmapa had given him this letter, right? And uh, yeah, in your book, you describe that... Um, you know, the letter actually says it not to be open until 1990, and he found it in 1989. So it was actually almost like, as the Kamapa had predicted, it wouldn't be open until later. Um, but then, yeah, so what happened then? So, it, you know, maybe you can just give us what happens in your book. So he says um, that he showed it to Topgar, but he actually didn't show the other Rinpoche's the letter until 1992, which is two years later, because he had said he didn't want to show them in a meeting that had happened in a hotel in 1990. So even that was stalled, right? So even though he had found the letter, he still yeah. waited another two years to actually show them. Yeah, well, well, try to, to actually this is the, 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 the meeting between the Kamapa and where the Kamapa uh, had given um, Tai Sisu this, uh, this, this talisman, as he was describing, uh, that actually occurred in, in, in a hotel in uh, Calcutta. Okay. Uh, uh, shortly before um, Kamapa went to America for treatment uh, and, and where he subsequently died. And so Taisitu uh, carried this around with him. Uh, and then it was sometime later when he went into retreat that he that he was obviously mulling over the possible whereabouts of the letter and so forth. And he, and he, he, he remembered that uh, he'd been given this uh, and initially he carried it around, uh, and then he'd actually, uh, because it was beginning to fray and get very sort of sweaty, uh, he'd put it in a belt, in, uh, which so he would carry it around in his waist. Uh, and he opened up this, uh, opened up the, 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 the pouch, so to speak, uh, and the letter was there inside. And he didn't at that point open the letter, but he suspected that this was had some significance and some importance. And so he informed the other other Rinpoche's to come to a meeting. Uh, and uh, Shamar didn't go to that meeting. Um, <laughs> I guess uh, he could probably foresee what what this might portend uh, for him. But uh, eventually they did all get together uh, after much prevarication and delays. Um, and they met in room tech. And it was at that point that Taisitu, having previously opened the letter, uh, summons the other heart sons, so to speak. Uh, and, and at Rumtek, he announced that he had found the letter. And uh, Gyaltsev uh, immediately agreed that this was the letter. Jamgon Control agreed that this was the letter. Uh, Shemar, uh, obviously very unhappy about this, um, questioned whether this was the authentic letter. Um, because he could see that, that if there was a race to see who was going to be bringing forward the, the next come up, uh, uh, he was lagging behind in this race. So he challenged this, this mm. letter and yeah. said, you know, how do, how, do, how do I know this is really, how do I know it's not a forgery? Uh, and he looked at the letter. Subsequently, he agreed to suspend his objections or he agreed to erase his objections, should I say. But then two or three weeks after that, after consultations between Shamar and Topka, uh, they questioned the translation which had been given of his agreement mm. to abide by the letter. Uh, and they used the word suspend his doubts about the letter. Yeah. So basically this situation wasn't resolved at all. Right. Now in the meantime, in the meantime, uh, Taisitu, with the agreement of the other heart sons, uh, had said, had, had announced that the letter had been found. 
The idea was that Jamgon Control would go to Tibet to investigate this letter and to, mm. to uh, ostensibly uh, lead lead a, a search party to find the to find the child. Uh, Jamgon Control had just been given a gift by his brother, who was a businessman uh, of a high powered BMW. Uh, and took it out for a spin. Uh, it's questionable whether he was driving, which would have been not allowed, or whether his driver mm -hmm. was driving. But in any event, the car skidded off the road uh, and he died in the accident. Mm -hmm. um, so that sabotage, as it were, the plan that Jamgon Control would, would, would go. But the eventual upshot of this was that Taisitu informed the Dalai Lama that he had found mm -hmm. a letter, uh, Akong Rinpoche, uh, who was the abbot of Sami Ling, uh, but very much uh, uh, on the side, if one wants to pick sides, on the side of uh, Tai Situ, uh, was instructed to go into to, to go to Tibet and uh, yes. organize the search. Well, can I, if I could just stop you there, just with the jungle yeah. control car accident. Um, uh, actually, um, when um, when uh, Taisitu presented the letter to the Four Heart Sons, it does actually say in your book that he <clears throat> he did insist that it should go to a forensic lab for testing because he did wonder if Shamar it was genuine. Yeah. And uh, Taisitu apparently said, according to your book, you know that he would die nine times before he would agree to that to be tested. Now I think you know this again shows that these documents, you know, they are considered very sacred, and you know he was not okay with that, just sending that off to a foreign. A forensic lab to be tested Absolutely. but Absolutely. with the jump gun control accident as well you know um it says as well in your book and there are many sort of uh you know kind of stories that you know this this crash this accident was suspicious it was not investigated by the police or the family there was no um proper investigation carried out and the fact there was also even suggestions that the mechanics who had serviced the car before you know had been arranged by top car um and coming from right. Bhutan, right? right and that it could have been a bomb or an explosion in terms of the way that the car uh you know it happened and and so on and so yeah, forth well, right? the engine the engine the engine was found the engine of the car was found some distance away from the, yeah. from the wreckage of the car. uh i mean it had come off the road and hit a tree uh, that was the, that was that was the point of it. Um, so yes, as you say, uh, mechanics uh, employed by Topgo had had, uh, had had serviced serviced the car. I'm not quite sure how old the car was actually. It's never emerged, or whether it really needed to be serviced. But anyway, under under any circumstances, that did certainly raise it does raise suspicions about quite how much of an accident this yes was. and apparently top guy kind of disappeared from rum tech for a short period of time for a period of time because people did actually think he'd done it right so he kind of went back to bhutan and we'll come on to this when um we get on to what happened in rum tech but um meanwhile in tibet uh you know bef while this is all going on in india um the 17 Karmapa Ogin Trinley Dorje Apogaga was born right in 1985. Mm. So in your in your chapter eight, you talk about this birth and the miraculous signs um, of his birth and how he was, you know, it was as predicted in the 16th Karmapa's letter. There was this conch sound that resounded for one hour. And yeah. he was eventually then, as you say, Akon Rinpoche went to Tibet and he was he was recognized as the recognition. In fact, there's a nice story in there about Akon Rinpoche, how he checked that it was the, the 16 Karmapa about the tooth. Do, That's do right. You... Yeah, well, he uh, the, Akon Rinpoche had said to the uh, 16th, as, as the 16th lay dying, uh, he'd said, will you please leave? something for me, a, a, a relic for me. Uh, and uh, the 16th had said, you know, you will, you will have a have a tooth. Uh, and after the after the cremation uh, of the 16th, uh, he'd asked if there were any teeth that had, that had been uh, been found. Um, subsequently, when they uh, when when the boy uh, was found, Abu Gaga was found and Akon Rinpoche met him for the first time. Um, he said to the boy, uh, you told me that you would leave something for me. He didn't say a tooth. He said, you told me that you would uh, give me a gift, that you would have something for me. 
uh, and the young boy, uh, according to the story, uh, reached under reached under the rug and and, and produced a milk tooth and uh, gave it to him. Yeah. So, so again, how again that, that obviously wonders. decided so, it yeah. for him, but how would he know that Akram Shah had asked the six and come up for a tooth? And again, well, he wouldn't. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Hey, you know, I mean, I'm I'm completely. I I believe that they have these super mundane qualities. So for me, this is quite yeah normal. But you know, so going then back into rum tech now. So there's this dispute going on, right? So in June, particularly after the the um. Taisitu and Gelsrumche got the approval from the Dalai Lama. Uh, the Shamar Rinpoche public, publicly then accuses uh, Taisitu Rinpoche of lying and, and fraud and issues a letter saying that, right? Hmm. Um, and so then um, there's a, a meeting at Rumtech uh, a, a couple of days after that where Taisitu makes a public announcement to everyone um that you know they found the letter and that it was in his amulet and at that time the meeting is interrupted by Shama Rinpoche with some Indian soldiers carrying shotguns now yeah. this is obviously when it starts to get quite violent and quite strange because a lot of people also in Sikkim were very unhappy that the Shama entered Rumtek with soldiers with shotguns so perhaps you could yeah, it's, mention it's something about, about that. soldiers it's the fact about soldiers that's the point um yeah yeah Shemar, Shemar had been invited as as were uh as, as was Gail said because um uh, uh Jamgon Control sadly dead but so Shemar had been invited to this meeting but he but he, he he wasn't actually there when the meeting began he hadn't turned up and then he suddenly this um he arrives in this in this jeep uh Riding shotgun, so to speak, in this, yeah. in this jeep uh, with armed soldiers and and a, a, uh, another jeep with more armed soldiers behind, uh, and and there's this tremendous sort of kerfuffle and, and fighting breaks out. Um, Taisitu and Gyal uh, seek sanctuary uh, in, in, inside the monastery itself. Uh, it's interesting, isn't it? Because some of the some of the monks uh, who are there. I mean, everybody's appalled by this. And some of the monks who are there say, "We've got this is just like it was in Tibet, mm -hmm. you know, with the Chinese um, soldiers turning up with rifles, pushing people around." Um, it's very odd because uh, Shamar Shamar said that explained this by saying that he'd heard word that there were camper warriors coming from coming from Tibet who were going to sort of um, cause trouble. Uh, Sikkimese government subsequently said that there was no hint of that being the case mm. uh, but the, the Indian government said uh, that they've been asked to provide an armed escort by uh, the Bhutanese the Bhutanese royal family yeah as it says in your book now but and the following are, so his, day this again introducing you know, yes trying to this is the situation. theme that runs through that and, it, and in fact you mentioned in the book as well that the following day state government went on a two-day strike at the use of the Indian army exactly. being deployed by central government without their consent or knowledge. So obviously it was very serious in terms of even a government issued, right? But let, going yeah. going into then, so the the, the 49-day puja for the, the passing of Jamgol control after the car accident came to an end in June as well. And they issued a petition to all the Kagulamas to sign that they supported Ogin Trinle Dorje, which they did. And at that time in Tibet, Kamapa had arrived at Serpu Monastery, the recognition that was going on there. So Shama is still showing some signs that he's not okay with it. And then you mentioned that Tuku Ergyan Rimshe with his son Chukinima arrives at Rampatek and pleads with Shama to recognize um, the Ogyan Tr Trinli Dorji. And he says to you, right, in his interview, uh, that he, he felt he could not refuse that. And so he issues a draft letter saying that he does accept the recognition by Dalai, Dalai Lama and Tai Situ. Is that right? Shemar issues a, a draft letter. Yeah, so after, you know, the, the Rinpoche from, comes to, you know, Chikini Mantuku Ogin Rinpoche come, they plead with Shemar, please recognize this, you know, this is getting out of hand. Uh, a draft letter was then issued saying that he accepted the recognition by the Dalai Lama and Tai Situ. I'm not sure if it's. I'm not sure if he if he unequivocally uh, recognized it. <laughs> I don't yeah. think he ever. I don't think he ever recognized it as 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 uh, subsequent events uh, yeah. uh, bore out. Sure. Um, I think I think what we have to understand is is that is that the battle lines are drawn now. 
and this is this is a real struggle and again it goes back to uh, this 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 constant sort of almost inseparable inseparable intermingling of 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 uh history tradition uh religion and politics uh, uh and i think for shamar very it's very much a case of you know who has the who who, who has the power here it's about power who who has the power to bring forward the kamapa because whoever has the power to bring forward the kamapa also has control of the kagyu school the kagyu properties um i mean we mustn't forget you know there's a lot of money at stake here there's there's uh, yeah. there's all sorts of things that are going into this and shamar, shamar is not going to relinquish this uh without a without a fight Yes, um, that, that's very clear in your book. And in fact, they wanted to enthrone Ogin Trinley Dorji at Ramtet, but this was not allowed right by the Chinese or even the Indian government. So he was enthroned at Serpu in September 92. And um, at that time, the Dalai Lama had officially confirmed it as well, because he was not uh, convinced by what the Shamapa was telling him about some unknown person, right, who who was yeah, that's right. Well, the Shema, the Shema had a meeting with the Dalai Lama um, and uh, the Dalai Lama and the Shema at this point was saying that uh, that, that he had other information about about, the, you know, the, the incarnation um, and the Dalai Lama, as you say, was 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 not at all convinced by this. And, and uh, Shema was unable. It, it, this was an argument the Shema kept kept producing that, you know, I have a name of somebody who can who can point to uh, who who the true reincarnation should be, uh, but he was never able actually to bring forward that name. If I asked him when I met him, I I, I said, "Well, will you name this Lama now?" Uh, and and he sort of prevaricated and said, "No, no, the time is not right," and so on and so forth. Um, so he never he never actually uh, he never actually named the person that he. Uh, claimed was was held the entire key to the uh, to, to ratifying his his, his authority yeah or and subsequently his candidate subsequently yeah, his candidate I'm, yeah yeah by well, the time let, I'm, let, I'm, let's get on I'm to I'm the candidate. the rival candidate then that he he puts forward because um after this has happened then and so Ogin Trinidad has been recognized in 1993 shortly after that the Shamar accuses even the Dalai Lama of having been deceived and conned and of it being a political conspiracy by Tai Situ to make Cherubling the center of Karma Kagyu and giving control to the Dalai Lama and Giluk. So, and then he claims that he's the only one who has the authority as well to recognize the Karmapas, but nonetheless, the Dalai Lama gives the official stamp. So mm -hmm. then um, he comes up with his, um, he says he's going to find his own candidate and um, at that time, Faisitu and Gyaltsa Rinpoche, they sack Tobga as the general secretary and take back control of Rumtek. Now, again, another incident happens at Rumtek in July 1993, after they've taken control back of Rumtek from Topgar and Shamar Rinpoche, which is about the rainy retreat that was being planned to be held there. Mm. And how Shamar Rinpoche had told some monks to, to lock the doors and not to allow this retreat to go on even though that was what Tai Situ and Gyeltsa Rinpoche wanted. So, uh, yeah, so what happened with that then? So, you know, in the book, you, you described that the Tai Situ and Gyeltsa, they turn up there and there's some violence and fighting going on over that as well, where the police had to be called. Yeah, it's the 16th century all over again. You know? <laughs> it's, yeah. it's, it's it's monks duking it out with one another. Uh uh, so there's there's a there's a there's a fight and a struggle between monks of I mean, some of the monks are supporting Shema, some of the monks are supporting uh, Tai Situ. Uh, but eventually what happens is that uh, the monks who support Shema are, are, are driven out of the monastery or retreat from the monastery, uh, one should say. And so they retreat down the hill uh, to, to, a, to a house that uh, Shema has. A, it must be more than a house because it has substantial grounds, enough for a large number of monks to actually sort of bivouac there, as it were, uh, where they stay for, for for the next one or two years. Um, you know, so you have this this sort of split in in uh, in room tech. But still, I mean, the, the the argument over who controls room tech that doesn't solve the argument over who controls room mm. tech. 
uh, because it, it that goes to the to the sort of governing body, secular governing body, as it were, of of, of Runtech, uh, most of whom uh, are, are Shamar placemen and Topgar placemen, uh, and so that begins a subsequently begins a legal wrangle, which goes on for years and years and right. years. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, this is something I, I want to discuss. Is obviously the the court cases that were brought by the Shamar and and his associates, including Ole Nadal and. So if we just go on then, so um, the, the Shama comes up with his own rival candidate who, again, it's quite yeah. mysterious as to who found this person and how he was identified and where he came from. Um, but it appears that the, the father of the Tai Doje, the, the, the candidate, um, had presented a letter saying that, you know, he thought his son might be the Kamapra and that the other Kagyu Lamas had seen this and felt that he was not, because if a father says, my son is the Kamapa, it's a sign that they're not, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. I mean, the the the, the suggestion was, this had all gone back to an, another, the, 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 the history of another uh, Kagyu Lama, the Mipam Rinpoche. Uh, and uh, again, and, uh, so it's so complicated, I wouldn't want to sort of uh, belabor your, your your viewers with the with the intricacies of this. But as you say, the, uh, a, a father had a somebody had written a letter uh, saying that their son was um, was 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 the Kamapa, uh, and uh, somebody had gone from Shamar, not Shamar himself. Somebody had gone from Shamar uh, and 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 met the boy uh, and talked with the family. And again, as you say, it's all very mysterious and not explained, and has never been explained. Perhaps one day it will be explained. Um, but eventually, this this young boy uh, turns up in 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 um, in India, uh, and and Shama says this this is the true reincarnation of the of the of the seventeen. Um, and he's enthroned I, I uh, the Delhi. He's enthroned, a, he's enthroned a Delhi in Delhi at Kibi, uh, which is this. Um, a, a Kagyu, so it's not a monastery. It's 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 a it's a it's a university or a sort of a college. Um, but there's it's a shrine room as as there would be. Uh, I subsequently met um, Tai Dorje, uh, and having met at the same, mm -hmm. pretty much the same time that I met uh, Shamar, uh, and it was striking the difference between having met the Kamapa and spent time with the Kamapa in Gyutu Monastery near Dharamsala. Uh, and and Tai Dorje presented himself, or was presented to me. Uh, one of the things that struck me was that at Gyoto meeting the Kamapa, uh, there'd been a, there'd been within the confines restrictions restrictions I should say of of the circumstances there. Nonetheless, uh, one was aware that one was meeting the Kamapa. You know, uh, there was a certain degree of, of 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 ritual around that, not really ceremony, but but you were aware that this was a very important person, a very holy person, uh, and that something was going on there. Uh, by contrast, meeting Tai Dorje, uh, I was shown to one of his rooms, which turned out to be uh, his classroom where he where where he was uh, taught things, uh, and, and he strolled in, young. Um, Rather sweet, mm. uh, young Tibetan boy, uh, just dressed in a in a, in a brown shirt and a, and, and a tuba, uh, bespectacled, rather studious, sprinkling of acne on his on his chin, um, and we talked earlier about charisma, and there was a very striking difference between mm. charisma around or that emanated from the seventeenth Kamapa. And the total absence of any charisma yeah. that emanated from Tai Dorje. Um, this yeah. is why it's important to also remember. So when he was enthroned at Kibi, you know, the majority of people at the enthronement were these Europeans who follow the uh, Ole Nadal and the Diamond Way. And, uh, you know, he is not uh, he's not followed by the majority of Karma Kagyu monks or teachers. And so he doesn't have that level of a following. And this is something as well that I think is people maybe are not fully aware of is that and uh, even at the enthronement, people protested outside and uh, right. Topgar, who'd been banished from Sikkim for the last three years, 
was allowed to come back in 1995. And he then led a march of monks to Rumtek Monastery, again, to demand that they give him and them access to Rumtek. And again, this was dispersed by the police. So he mm. then um, died soon after that and was given a full state ceremony by the Bhutanese royal family. And then Tai Doji continues teaching in the Oli Nadal centers in Europe and the US, right? Now, yeah. this in your book, we're getting onto the point now where, you know, he's obviously supported by um, Shama Rimshe and the Oli Nadal Europeans, but certainly not by the vast majority of Tibetans, Kama Kagyu Tibetans, but even Western followers, right? So well, then the law. Yeah, so then the lawsuits and court cases are starting now, right, by the Shama and his associates. Between 1993 to 98, you mentioned that they're trying to take back control of Rumtek via court procedures. And you mentioned one petitioner, Sri Narayan Singh, who was a former monk, a monk at Rumtek, who filed even a criminal complaint against the, the sort of lamas there as hatching a plot with China to bring Sikkim under TA, TRA control, and it was dismissed. But as a result of that story, which obviously they they tried to get really out into the Indian media, you know, Tai Situ was banned from entering e India for several years. He was seen as a Chinese spy and they called the Elgin Trinley Doji a Chinese Kamapa. And so he was, Tai Situ was forbidden from going into India, unable to travel to Sikkim or Rumtek. And, you know, they labeled the Kamapa as a Chinese Kamapa, right? So, yeah, maybe you can say a little bit about those court cases and also the damaging effect that that sort of rumor or that, that you know, this was a, a plot by, you know, uh, them to sort of try the Chinese to try and take control of, of Sikkim in some way. Well, I think I think that's but I think that goes even before Tai George arrived on the scene when the Kamapa first came into into India in 2000. Uh, and of course, one of the first things he does is, is, is he goes to see the to see the Dalai Lama, and there's there's this wonderful picture, isn't there? And I remember seeing postcards of this picture in in, in, in Dharamsala when I was there, of of, of the Kamapa and uh, and Dalai Lama together. For, for a lovely lovely picture. But even at that point, uh, there was the suspicion, uh, wrongly. Uh, in the Indian government, uh, about whom the Kamapa was, how the Kamapa had suddenly just turned up in in India, uh, the suggestion that, or was he a, was he a Chinese agent? Was he a Chinese spy? Uh, the, the fact of the delicacy uh, in relations between China and India as Sikkim, you know, as a, as a sort of border or autonomous state. Um, you know, all of these factors kind of contributed to the fact, and this is why, this is why the Kamapa was without a monastery of his own to go to when he's in Dharamsala, uh, is installed in Gyoto Monastery, uh, where he stays for an unconscionable number of years, I mean, effectively a, 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 mm. a prisoner. Um, and I vividly remember that we're, on the times that I would go and meet the Kamapa and talk to the Kamapa, there would always be uh, an Indian security guy hovering in the background. Uh, one occasion I remember was was um, I mean absurdly, uh, you know, where I was followed out of the monastery uh, by an Indian security guy trying to f find out what I'd been talking to the Kamapa about. Had he said anything about his plan? So there was this aura of suspicion from the Indian government, doubtless fermented by Shamar and Shamar as allies in order to try and undermine the, the Kamapa and the state of the Kamapa. Yeah. Uh, and so I think the, 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 the court cases that, that subsequently you just referred to that subsequently came up and all the petitions that were made, I think there's no question whatsoever that these were, were part of the strategy of, of Shamar and the Shamar group to again try and further undermine and so the seeds of doubt about the Kamapa and about the Kamapa's credibility. Yeah. And none of them, as far as I could see, uh, reading those cases, none of them had any sort of uh, credibility or... or, or yeah. You know, I think um, now, now we can see that they were just um, 
a smoke screen. I don't I don't think they, they yes really, and they... I, and I think that that leads nicely on to you know one of the final chapters. I mean obviously you talk about the escape from Tibet of the Kalmarpa and this really Okay, so just turning to the last chapters of your book now then. So you did also uh, get interview with the, the, the 14th Dalai Lama about this, and uh, he refused to recognize the Shamap as candidate for a variety of reasons. But it seemed like the most compelling one is he didn't, he didn't mention who this kind of mysterious person was who was supporting the identification, right? Exactly, yeah. No, well, I think this was this was uh, Shamar's sort of last throw of the dice, really, you know, to try and appeal to the Dalai Lama that 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 he and he alone was the was the was the person uh, who should be bringing forth the uh, the, the reincarnation. Uh, and as you say, uh, he again talked about this mysterious person who was supposed to hold the key to to everything, but refused to name the the, the, the mysterious person, um, which. Having systematically refused to name this mysterious person does beg the question: Did this mysterious person actually exist? Yeah, um, and, and there's the large... mention of uh, Chopki uh, Rinpoche, which was mentioned as someone who apparently had suggested there was this reincarnation, and and the Dalai Lama said that he checked that, and he'd actually written to this Rinpoche, and the Rinpoche had said he had absolutely nothing to do with this recognition, which obviously kind of sealed it in a way, but. Um, moving on swiftly to the the escape from Tibet, because this is also ironic, considering that there was these accusations flying around that the, the 17th Kamapa was a Chinese spy and it was a Chinese plot. The, the escape story, in a way, kind of counters all of that. Well, it should do is that he risked his life and limb and people around him also. Very dangerous situation. Lots of Chinese guards on the way. In the dead of night, yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's, winter, it's an incredible story. Really it's cold. And, you know, this is someone who went to possibly risking his life and that of others, you know, and they're saying that he's a he's a Chinese spy. So, yeah, that's kind of um, counters that in a way. Oh, well, of course it does. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I, you know, that that allegation was ridiculous, you know, from 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 the very first moment that it was laid. Uh and the story of his escape is 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 extraordinary. I mean, it was it was very very carefully planned by by uh, by, by two or three uh, confidants of, of the Kamapa. Uh, plans were immaculately laid, uh, but it's a, a long and perilous journey uh, uh, through uh, icy passes mm -hmm. in terrible weather. Uh, other people have attempted to do that in the past. Other escapees, people trying to get out of Tibet. And have died as a result of it, um, but they managed to do that, and, and extraordinary. And I spoke to, um, I spoke to, uh, I spoke about this with the Kamapa, of course, but also with 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 the person uh, who had organised it, uh, Lama Swang, and yeah, uh, somebody else who who'd been there, um, uh, Kamapa's attendant, Drupnak, uh, yeah, yeah, a fairly elderly gentleman, in fact, yes, um, yeah, he saved his life, we... right? He said that the Kamapa saved his life on the way, even you know that he almost that's, fell. That, and... That's that's right, that's right. Um, yeah, I remember vividly uh, sitting sitting in a room in, in Gyoto where this story was being told, and uh, very crowded that that Gyoto monastery, and people wandering in and out, and, and people sitting down and sort of um, listening to this story and being absolutely sort of wrapped mm. by it, spellbound by it. Uh, and again, I mean, there's so much in, in the course of writing this book that I found very moving and very yes. inspiring. Um, and uh, yeah, just just very, that touched me very, very deeply. Yes. Well, you know, you did get access also to the 17th Kamapa when he arrived in Dharamsala, and you write about that in the book. And this is also very interesting because you talk about also how heavily restricted he was there, right? So he he was monitored a lot and he was unable even sometimes to go outside within the area. Um, and so, but eventually, obviously, he was then eventually able to travel abroad. Um, but let's move on to sort of, after your book was published. So the book was published in 2004. Um, now, what is the reaction to the book? Because the, the unique feature of your book, and this is what I want to say to people and why I would recommend it, is that you are a journalist, you are an independent writer, and you did get access to speaking to everyone in this story. Um, so you yeah. spoke to everyone. Um, 
on sort of both sides, if you like. Um, so how how was it how was it reacted to? Because I read some things that you know you were threatened with lawsuits as well. And so what's the story with that then? What actually happened to you? Well, <laughs> um, I, I, let's say I don't think it went down terribly well with Shamar Rinpoche uh, and and with pe people around uh, Shamar Rinpoche. Uh, and so uh, this this uh, website uh, popped up called Come Up for Issue, uh, which became the platform basically for, um, I mean, attacking seems, I don't, don't want to over-dramatize it, but I'll, I'll use the word attacking anyway, uh, for trying to discredit me, I should say. Uh, and, and if ever I had any any uh, lingering doubts about the capacity for um, the deception and intrigue uh, in, in Tibetan Buddhism, then this uh, uh, eliminated those remaining doubts because things were being said about me and about the gestation of the book that were patently untrue. Uh, it was alleged that, um, that the publishers uh, and I had been in, in, in cahoots with the, with the Dalai Lama to write this book completely untrue. Uh, it was also alleged that I was a, a, a disciple of Akong Rinpoche, uh, completely untrue. I, I, I'd spoken to Akong Rinpoche. Um, I'm not a disciple of Akong Rinpoche. I wasn't a disciple of Akong Rinpoche, I should say, because he's since died. Um, uh, I'm not, as you, as you said, I'm, I'm not a Buddhist. I'm, yeah. I'm, a, I'm, I'm a journalist. I'm, I'm a reporter. So there were these attempts to discredit me and to discredit the book. Uh, I mean, one in particular was, um, and, and of course, Shaman never actually put his name to these allegations on the Kamapa issue site. They, they were they were sort of allegations that would be made by other people, placemen or supporters of Shaman. Uh, what I remember was uh, an account, uh, supposed account of my meeting with Shaman in this hotel in Delhi where I'd met Shaman Rinpoche which was a kind of very strange and somewhat uneasy meeting, um, and which I had recorded in the book uh, and recorded, literally recorded the conversation that I had with Shamar uh, on a tape recorder. So I, I, I had a record of that. Uh, and an account was 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 published on, on Kamapa issue uh, by Shamar's uh, secretary, uh, which gave a, a completely misleading and, and untrue account of, of, of what had occurred in that meeting. So all of this was 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 uh, it was it was sort of unsettling, but uh, but one's used as a journalist to having you know to, to having these sorts of responses. Yeah, I was going to. So did did they actually threaten legal action against you, or, or or did because you had recorded all of these meetings as you're a journalist? As yeah, you there, there, there were there were sort of suggestions of legal action, but but nothing 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 nothing, you know, nothing ever happened. Yeah. Anyway, um, so moving just on to sort of more current issues then. And uh, so, so you know, they accused you of lying. They actually said that the Dalai Lama had been conned and deceived. But uh, certainly the Dalai Lama, in your interview with him, when he was asked, um, he certainly felt that there was no evidence to suggest that their candidate had any authority. But also he said that, um, that it had been suggested that, you know, the Chinese Kamapa could keep Tsurfu and the Indian Kamapa could keep Rumtek. And the Dalai Lama also said, well, that's just not what happens because the, right. the Kamapas have only ever had one incarnation historically. And the Rumtek seat is the seat of exile of the Kamapas. So he was also quite clear on that. And again, I think yeah. the sort of accusations that, again, the Dalai Lama was trying to control Kagyu don't actually quite fit with what he actually said. In fact, he was actually really, I think, trying to ensure that the 17th Kamapa had his seat in both Tibet and no, India. I think that's right. And that's a, I think that's a very important point to make because there have been, you know, in amongst all this sort of miasma of, of, of rumour and intrigue and, and speculation and what does this mean and what does that mean? You know, the idea, as you say, that, that, that the Dalai Lama was trying to control uh, could control the Kagyu. I mean, maybe, I don't know, maybe we should make a distinction between the Dalai Lama and, and, the, Gelug, and, yeah. and, and the Gelug. Um, I think so. My, 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 my impression, when I, when I spoke to the Dalai Lama, he spoke very warmly of the 16th and talked about the friendship that he'd had with the 16th. Uh, Talked about the 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 the, the settlement uh, organization that that you mentioned earlier on, uh, 
and admitted that that had caused a little bit of friction. Well, yeah, friction. I was going to say, he does this. say that, that that made him a bit sad that the 16 Kamapa had said to people that he didn't want to be involved in politics. And, uh, you know, so there, there obviously was some sort of dis subtle disagreement, let's say, about how to deal with the whole Tibet issue. And to yeah, be well, honest with you, I there is some kind of discussion even now. And even when the 17th Marvel was in India, you know, he there was a meeting in which he was addressing the Dalai Lama directly, which is on video, where he talks about the Giluk hegemony and the power here. And uh, yeah, I mean, it, it it it's definitely still an issue. I mean, certainly now there's a democratic procedure, but I think certainly in Dharamsala, at least, there is an issue about you know, it's still very Gilug dominated. And there's a quote in your book, I think, which says, Dharamsala is a yellow umbrella with a crooked top. I don't know if you remember well, somebody that. Somebody says that. Yeah, I don't write that, but somebody says no. that. Um, and Nick Malama yeah, I mean, says I, 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 I laughed I, 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 when I heard that because I thought, well, actually, that's a kind of a very good analogy. And and the fact that the Kamapa, you know, he was so restricted and only recently was really allowed to go abroad and he was never, you know, allowed to go to Rumta. He always had to stay in this Gilug monastery, Gyoto, which was never really his. Um, mm. You know, it suggests that maybe, not the Dalai Lama, like you say, but maybe there were other forces at play there, which were very also intent on keeping him under a certain amount of control. And the 70 Kamapa recently said in 2019 at a Kagyu Monlam speech, for example, that the Dalai Lama gave him Getzul vows, the vows of a monastic, which had not been requested. Um, so that was something that had kind of been forced on him, which I think people were quite shocked when he when he announced that. Uh, that should have been given by a Kama Kagyu Lama, he was saying. Um, so that's a whole other issue. But um, just returning, because well, obviously- I, I just, I, I, let, let me just say that I think, you know, as far as the as far as the the Kamapa's confinement, uh, I, I think that was that that was that was at the instruction of of the Indian government. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't think the Dalai Lama had any had any intention or any objective mm. in the Kamapa being confined in Kyoto Monastery. Uh, and as I say, when when I met the Dalai Lama, he spoke very warmly of the Kamapa. Uh, when mm -hmm. I met the Kamapa. He's always spoken very warmly of the Dalai Lama, and I, 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 I think the point is that the Dalai Lama, his 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 position is that, how can I put this? You know, because he's 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 always been the sort of the, the spiritual and and the, the and the political head of uh, of, of of Tibetan Buddhism. Um, you know, he he thinks it's very important that. Uh, that the freedom, the struggle for the freedom of Tibet has always been important because mm. it's important as a as a place where Tibetan Buddhism flourishes. And he's always seen it as being very important that the Dharma should be uh an, you know an, an important Yeah. But as you know, uh, as yeah. you mentioned in the book as well, you know, some of the sort of you know, when the Chinese really pushed back and got more restrictive was often because of some of the 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 sort of actions taken by the Dalai Lama, for example, like when he got involved in the Panchen Lama recognition and they found out about that, you know, that that really intensified a real sort of vilification of the oh. Dalai Lama in Tibet. Oh. And so there's a question as well about, because of the way that the Gilug took over Tibet in the 17th century with the Mongolians and the violence and the takeover of all those monasteries, you know, over 40 Kagyu monasteries apparently were taken over, you know, that karmically let's say certainly within the buddhist world they would talk about that that you know there's something connected with this because the chinese in particular have a very strong resistance and kind of almost vilification of the dalai lama uh whereas with the karma kagyu lamas although they did they did try and heavily restrict ogin trinley doji which is why he escaped right um there's there's sort of been a sort of a more of a connection there with the Chinese emperors in the past, as you mentioned in your book. But you know, Ogin Trinley Doji speaks Chinese fluently. He was recognized by the Chinese government, even though they tried to, you know, make him his their puppet. And so I think some people, because the 17th of when I was teaching, especially on some of the takeover of the Kagyu monasteries, I think people are starting to sort of understand that actually. The Dalai Lama is not Tibet. He's not Tibetan Buddhism. It is much older and bigger than that. And I think that's something that also, you know, has come out from the 17th century that actually 
you know, it it is a much bigger and wider and longer history than that, right? Than just the sure. The but I think, but 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 I, I think uh, to, to me, as as a, as a non-Buddhist, you know, yeah. uh, there's a, a rather rather kind of crude phrase. Uh, <laughs> you, know, you know, I don't I don't have a dog in this fight. You know, um, <laughs> between between the, between the Gelug and the and, and the Kagyu. Um, and I, it strikes me as being as being uh, rather obstructive that you know there should still be these arguments going back four hundred years. You know that they should still be having a bearing on 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 what is the imperative in the situation, which is to preserve and honor uh, the, the the teachings of Buddhism. Sure. Uh, to, to to try and preserve those as much as possible within Tibet, the Chinese. Yeah. They've done everything they can to try and extirpate those teachings. Uh, there was that extraordinary, it now seems almost surreal window of opportunity. You know, when when the the, the Kamapa and other other uh, other Tulkus were 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 allowed to be allowed to be recognised. I mean, now uh, Tibetan Buddhism in in Tibet is is held in an iron fist, uh, and there there are no freedoms uh, at all. Um, yeah. I mean, there is, it is still practiced, but but it's practiced under a very watchful eye of, mm. of, of the Chinese. Exactly. And so the question the question really is now: What happens when when the Dalai Lama dies? I mean, that's yeah. the big that's the big question. And of course, the Chinese, having seized the installed their own puppet Panchen Lama uh, as as a sort of precedent, as it were, mm. for them to then be able to bring forth a puppet Dalai Lama. Yes. The Dalai Lama had said specified that he won't be reincarnated. Uh, well, I, I mean, I think exactly the whole approach to the Chinese government, it's a big topic. And, you know, it's just, I guess, that if um, there does seem to be obviously be a very, very clear vilification and resistance to the Dalai Lama. And, you know, some researchers and scholars who are now looking into that sort of takeover of Tibet and how violent it was and how much property was taken from other lineages, only now to see the light of day, for example, in the 21st century, you know, we're seeing texts of Kagyu texts, which have not been allowed to be taught or read in the Kagyu monasteries until recently, you know, scholars are starting to see these things. And I think that is starting to just make people question a bit more about what actually happened in Tibet as well. But just going back into mm -hmm. your book and the sort of the meeting with the two Karmapas, okay, so so obviously your book, they, they, they reacted strongly against it and they accused you of many untrue things. But then what about this meeting? Because some people some somehow felt that this was somehow justifying that there was a second Karmapa, but in actual fact, um, you know, devotion or sort of belief is something that really can't be forced on people. And and so, despite this meeting, the vast majority of so, so you talk about the meeting of the Tai Doji and Tai Doji. Yeah. yeah. So some people, I think, particularly on the Tai Doji side, you know, somehow saw this as a legitimation or validation of him as the Kamapa. But in actual fact, um, as you know, the 17 Kamapa is still not allowed to visit or teach at Rumtek. And it, that all stems from those court cases that were initiated by, by them. And on top of that, you know, they're saying, well, um, you can't force devotion on people. You can't force people to follow him and accept him as the second Kamapa. And so the vast majority of people still do not. And I think that's also, again, it's it's created some sort of, misunderstanding as well what was that meeting for or about well I don't think anyone's suggesting that everyone now has to accept that he is the another Karmapa right I mean what's your view on that uh well um well I mean very little has been said about that meeting and very little has been said about what came out of that meeting and there's no sort of transcript of the conversation that that, that took place between uh, the 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 the, the come up and uh, Tai Dorje. Um, I mean, let's look now. I mean, Tai Dorje now is um, married, uh, has a has a child, uh, uh, and is still, as I understand it, still um, teaching. You know, teaching in in centres that support him. Uh, the come up's situation uh, is, is is somewhat different. Um, I'm I'm slightly puzzled by the by the but by, by the lack of information, lack of hard information surrounding uh, the Kamapa and his whereabouts now. I mean, variously 
Um, uh, I'm, I'm told that he, he's in uh, America. He was the mm. last, uh, last I heard, but it's also been suggested he might be somewhere in Europe and so forth. Um, I, I'm, despite having, <laughs> particularly perhaps because having written this book, I'm no authority on mm. uh, on on. on um, Okay, so maybe I should ask you this up. then. Why why do you think the come up is seventy is still not being allowed to go to Rumtek? And even when he was in India, even after you know he met this other the Thai Doja, you know, he's still not allowed to teach there. So many people see this as a it's, it's a real issue, right? Because you know, he's tried to sort of, you know, show some friendship, you know, and but but still, you know, he's still being denied the right to go to Rumtek and and to teach there. So why do you think that might yeah, well, be? Well, I, I would think, I, I mean, the main the main the main obstacle in all of this, and of course, the main obstacle throughout the throughout the come up from the moment of his recognition uh, was the Shama Rinpoche uh, and the Shama Rinpoche died. Mm -hmm. um, so we can't say that the Shama Rinpoche is behind this. I can't imagine that Tai Dorje uh, is is personally uh, causing these obstacles, um, unless he's a much more ambitious uh, person than I have been the young uh, boy that I met. Um, so, as far as I understand, the, the 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 obstacle to him going to Rumtek is that the the court case about who controls room tech has still not been resolved. Right. Uh, and that, and that was it... initiated by the, the Shamapa and his associates, right? So exactly. in some ways that's exactly. still ongoing, that kind of that ongoing. barrier. Of him. One I mean, of the things that this the, the meeting between the two, the two of them indicated was that there's an indication, a determination, I should say, on the part of the Kamapa to 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 to, to put the feuding mm. aside, to put schism aside and to mm. try and find some way of bringing people together and that to me seems to be uh in a spirit of sort of reconciliation harmony and right. compassion that what i associate with tibetan buddhism yeah absolutely and i think other people felt that too but anyway yes. on that note uh mick because actually you know your book is a is a real gem in terms of uh an investigative reporter a uh, historical background, you know, I would recommend it to anyone who's interested in, like you say, not just the 17 Kamapa issue, also about the 16 Kamapa, the politics of reincarnation, you know, it's really, really valuable. So I just wanted to thank you very much for writing Oh, I'm that. very, very flattered you should say that. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, also your other books, you know, really fascinating for music fans, but also you know, about the spiritual tourism, about, you know, the East and the West. So you mentioned you have a you have a, a forthcoming book coming out. Is that right? On this uh, topic? Yeah, I've got a book uh, called The Nirvana Express, which is being published in September uh, here and in America. Uh, and that that is a history of the West's engagement with Indian spirituality going back to the to the 18th century, beginning with um, a rather extraordinary man called Edwin Arnold. Uh, who wrote the first poetic telling of the life of the Buddha uh, oh, okay. in Victorian times. And extraordinary, extraordinarily became a, a million seller at that time. Uh, oh, well, and, I've and never was, heard of that, but now I have. So thanks again uh, well, for, uh, and, yeah. And, and rather, rather, rather felicitous, rather uh, happily, I should say, uh, he was editor of the Daily Telegraph when he wrote that book. So... I feel oh, how so interesting. Yeah. yeah. Well, I like look connection. forward to that. Yeah. That's, uh, again, something else that, you know, we can sort of learn about that we didn't know about before. So anyway, Mick, it's been a pleasure talking to you. And uh, thank you very much again for writing that book. And um, I certainly hope that, you know, eventually we will see the 17 come up uh, at Rumtek in India and traveling around the world freely. And uh, yeah, I wish you all the best with your, your publications and work as well. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Adele. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you.